All right, hi everyone. We're just gonna give everyone about one more minute to join into this session. All right, so let's get started. So my name is Alexandra DeLazio. I'll be the moderator for today's session. Um, you are in session IC63, um, entitled Standardized Seating. Can a wheelchair selection algorithm work? And our speaker today will be Sarah Lusto. Um, we will have a CEU code at the very end of the session today and questions will be fielded about with about 10 minutes to go. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me for this presentation uh, today. Um, a little bit of just background about me. Um, so uh, when at the time that I submitted um, the proposal for this presentation, um, I was a physical therapist and assistive technology professional at the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation in West Orange, New Jersey. Um, I was at Kessler for 11 years. I primarily worked on the spinal cord injury and brain injury units. Um, and for about the past five or six years, I served as the inpatient wheelchair team lead. Um, and I also worked in our outpatient wheelchair seating clinic as well. Um, at the beginning of the summer, I transitioned into a clinical education manager role uh, with Permobile. Um, so again, this presentation did take place um, during my time at Kessler, um, but I have transitioned into a role at Permobile uh, within our clinical education team. Um, so I just wanted to, to make you aware of that. Um, I do have a little disclosure um, about that as well on an upcoming slide. I also wanted to give you a little bit of information um, about the background of this presentation itself. Um, so this project is one for me that I'll admit um, caught me a little bit uh, by surprise. Um, because when this idea first came about, I wasn't sure what it would look like or what role it could serve within the scope of the broader context of both pressure injury prevention as well as service and delivery of CRT. Um, but the more I started to think about it, the more I started to see that uh, while cushion selection is a consistent component of our clinical practice um, guidelines and a part of really our comprehensive pressure injury prevention and treatment plans, um, there was a limited um, evidence-based practice um, and evidence-based information concerning the actual process of cushion selection made accessible across all settings and, and all models of care. Um, it also made me realize that there were kind of these gaps of knowledge um, created by limited access to both physical and economic resources uh, across those different settings, which kind of prevented the actualization of those evidence-based recommendations um, from ever becoming a part of a, a realized um, portion of the plan of care. And it was kind of this realization that really brought me around to the idea of what a clinically correlated risk assessment based tool could have the potential to do. Not only, um, you know, not necessarily as a, a replacement for an existing standard of care, but more as a proactive kind of point of entry into evidence-based seating um, and positioning interventions. So I wanna make clear from the beginning that you know, the proposal of um, a cushion selection algorithm in no way is, is meant to replace the current standards of care we have for um, seating and mobility assessment uh, and evaluation, um, but certainly as an adjunct or even as that kind of proactive um, point of entry. So um, again, just um, some quick disclosures. Um, this project was started while I was employed as a physical therapist at Kessler, um, but I am currently employed as a re uh, clinical regional education manager um, at Permobile. Some objectives um, that I wanna hopefully touch base on with all of you today are to identify really what the basis for a wheelchair cushion selection algorithm could look like. 
describe some of the limitations of the Braden scale and explain how utilization of subscales may assist in identifying risk more accurately, explain how different wheelchair cushion evaluation and selection methods and processes are impacted by setting and service delivery models, and identify some of the pros and cons of a cushion selection algorithm. If I were to summarize kind of the rationale for why this presentation even exists at all, it, it would essentially be this quote. Um, so, you know, pressure ulcers are a complex and multifaceted problem, which require the consideration of patient, provider, and system level strategies to address them. But, you know, whys inevitably are followed by another question, um, and that's how. You know, how do we accomplish this? How do we, um, what have we tried to accomplish in the past? How have we made progress? And ultimately, um, maybe how have we continued to fall short? And some of that starts with thinking about how both the reactive and proactive aspects of pressure injury prevention, intervention, and treatment, um, you know, what are they? How have they existed in the past? Um, and how do they exist um, within different models of our own clinical practice as uh, well as the healthcare system as a whole? Um, you know, what are we doing clinically to push toward more and more proactive approaches? Um, and how are we seeing the healthcare system maybe remain stagnant um, in, and static in their reactive policies um, and adaptations? And oftentimes, even when hospitals put in place uh, policies meant to, to seem preventative and, and proactive, these are often catalyzed only in response to negative outcomes, um, such as increased incidences of hospital acquired uh, pressure injury. So even though they seem proactive on the surface, they're, they're, active, they're actually reactive in nature. And alongside this disparity then in reactive and proactive approaches, um, we see this, this higher variability in the focus of research and intervention and prevention that's highly dependent on setting and service delivery models. And ultimately this has the potential to place uh, disproportionately high value on certain factors while dismissing others depending on their frequency of study. So when we consider you know, the factors that are affecting um, systems like the VA, or you know, versus for-profit systems versus not-for-profit systems, for example, or consider um, the factors that are involved in acute care hospital settings versus critical care settings versus subacute or home care settings. Um, you know, these factors are very different across these different models as well as these different settings. So how can we shift our focus when we think about research as well as when we think about proactive interventions um, to kind of correspond um, with these different factors, uh, both within our research as well as within our approaches. And of course, um, finding out how also involves finding out um, some of the things that are stopping our progress toward um, that goal. And this involves understanding some of our barriers. Um, what barriers exist and also kind of importantly, how are these barriers interconnected to one another? At an institutional level, we often see investment in pressure injury prevention and intervention, but only to the extent of what we've kind of already talked about, which is reactive policies. There's a response often to of, um, policy for policy's sake, right? A preoccupation with policy um, over procedure or over um, process that could um, more positively impact patient outcome rather than just creating a policy that's reactive um, to something that we're seeing. Um, and, you know, so, you know, we're seeing this policy preoccupation and kind of neglecting everything that, that needs to come after that. Um, so there's an initial investment up front, but then not an investment what, that, with everything that has to happen um, on the back end. And then at this level, there's also often this barrier of resource allocation. Um, and that's resources as they pertain both to you know, physical equipment and, and physical resources, um, such as in the case of access to seating and position equipment itself, um, but also to time um, and to financial investment. And time in the sense of you know, are um, set, uh, clinical settings and institutions willing to utilize staffing resources in a way that sacrifice billable productivity for improved service and delivery? Um, all the way to allocated um, specialized staff for co-treatments or for rounding with uh, wound care teams, for example, or to the evaluation of equipment needs outside of therapy time uh, in order to provide additional care that expands on the traditional uh, billable models um, and how we think of that. Um, specifically, in, you know, in inpatient uh, settings, we think, you know, this um, has high, you know, 
uh, effect because of you know things like three hour rule and everything like that, there, there's a high propensity to place um, really um, important uh, policies on, on staffing um, and on allocation of time and on allocation of, of billable productivity. Um, but how can we work with our managers and with our directors of re, uh, rehab to really understand the importance of, of specialized resource allocation um, from, a, from a staffing perspective? Um, and then of course, um, you know, from a financial um, aspect, looking at how, you know, how can we work with our uh, institutions in understanding um, how they're allocating um, uh, resources from a financial perspective um, to a more proactive sense um, to say if we allocate maybe more financial resources up front, that might actually help them um, recoup financial loss um, on the back end. Um, and finally, we see barriers um, related to sh um, shifts in case mix um, index as well. So, you know, we see um, shorter and shorter lengths of stays in the acute care setting. Um, and what has that done to increase the acuity um, of individuals going into inpatient rehabilitation settings? Um, and then the push of other patients into subacute facilities and long-term care facilities at a higher acuity. And then the resulting um, risk of patients bypassing rehabilitation settings altogether and going directly into home care. Um, and when that happens, we see a burden placed on home care settings to provide access to CRT and seating and positioning evalu evaluations where maybe they didn't have the access to resources um, to perform those types of evaluations or the access to knowledge um, to know the types of referral processes involved um, in handling those um, needs and goals. And certainly within the clinical sphere, um, we're also seeing barriers, uh, many of which have a relationship to those seen at the institutional level, um, including a high degree of variability to access of knowledge and resources that can vary dependent on setting and resources allocated to them by their clinic or hospital. Um, and this is something I saw even with on our own system. Um, so I worked you know, for the Custer Institute for Rehabilitation, but that was part of a larger hospital system owned by Select Medical. So there was a high degree of variability of access to knowledge and resources, um, even within our own inpatient rehab division. And how does that, um, how can that serve as a barrier um, that maybe we have the potential to influence? Um, also looking at a lack of consensus uh, among disciplines. Um, if we think about, you know, individuals that we worked with, you can talk with um, the nursing staff, you can talk with wound care specialists, you can talk with uh, therapists, both from a seating and positioning background and from a non-seating and positioning background, and talk with them about interventions and preventative strategies and treatment strategies for pressure injury um, and for seating and positioning, um, things like allocation of equipment. Um, and you're going to get very different answers um, just based solely off of their educational background, as well as their experiential background. Um, so, so looking at how do we address um, the differences in consensus um, when we talk about that and talk about that with the physicians as well. And then barriers to specialization. Um, and this relates back to um, some kind of that aspect of, of time resource allocation, but we're seeing, I think, fewer and fewer clinicians being able to get into specializations like wound care specialization um, and ATP specialization um, because there may be limits um, to the types of um, specialized courses they can attend and specialized pathways um, to those more advanced specializations. So how can we as an industry um, support the continued uh, advancement of specialization for clinicians? And then at the insurance industry level, I think we're all familiar with the barriers that exist due to the detrimental impacts of diagnosis specific coverage criteria for wheelchair cushions. Uh, but this also affects the availability of care, reimbursement, uh, insurance coverage for services, along with uh, continuity, uh, continuity of care uh, and improve, improve patient uh, provider relationships. So then taking kind of all of that background, looking at some of those barriers and taking all that into consideration, um, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the more specific chain of events that led to the development of the wheelchair cushion selection algorithm uh, within our own specific setting. 
Um, so it did start with a policy ask. Um, it start with, uh, started with a policy, a policy ask um, from our division leadership. Um, so not from within um, our hospital leadership, but within um, the whole inpatient um, division. So across multiple inpatient hospitals um, within the select medical um, system. And um, basically they came to us and they said they wanted to develop a policy for how we distribute cushions um, at admission. And this was the point where I was kind of unsure of the direction this would wind up going, um, because this was the point I, I was a little skeptical um, about the investment um, that they had um, of a truly proactive approach. Um, but I talked with our director of rehab and I talked with my clinical manager and we kind of came up together with a plan of how to go back to them, uh, engage the direction they were willing to go and the investment they were, they were willing to make. Um, and so this statement uh, became this statement. Um, so what if we develop a process uh, to make how we distribute cushions at admission more effective. Um, so we started by shifting the conversation of policy into one of surrounding clinical process. Um, and then we took it a step further and I found a thesaurus uh, and some research articles. Um, and we turned that initial policy ask into one that now felt comfortable. Um, I felt comfortable with being rooted more in evidence and clinical support. Um, so ultimately um, our, our, final, our final ask to them became, well, what if we develop um, a standardized tool for risk-based clinical correlated equipment recommendation. Um, so it sounded much more official um, and it, sound, it sounded like something um, that we could take uh, back to leadership um, and really um, surround kind of a whole um, group of processes um, around. Um, but even more importantly than that, um, the leadership showed um, that they were willing to invest a real change by developing a clinical task force um, that would be focused not only on policy, but on a whole multimodal approach to pressure injury prevention. So the initial discussions did involve um, our inpatient long-term care and critical care divisions of select medical, um, but ultimately this was narrowed down to our inpatient rehabilitation um, division. Um, we felt that we could kind of um, reflect more uh, initial change um, at that level and then eventually potentially expand it to include our long-term care and critical care divisions. So the clinical task force was comprised of physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing and leadership members. And we met to review the current patient outcomes and patient care goals um, for the task force. The task force then established um, and developed a plan for education, training, documentation, and protocols related to pressure injury prevention across the patient care spectrum. And it was at this point um, that I started looking at the development of a wheelchair cushion selection algorithm um, as part of this um, group of interventions. So it was my task to kind of take on the lead of developing the basis for the algorithm. And to do that, I looked at some of um, developing some rationale for the development. Um, so looking at establishing uh, the clinical standards for care to improve patient outcomes, obviously that was kind of the first big point, um, but also looking at increasing clinical confidence of non-specialized staff. So how could we get our non-specialized staff more clinically confident in both assessing risk for pressure injury, but also understanding the correlations that that had with a, equipment, special, um, equipment specification um, and also referral um, into wheelchair seating and mobility evaluation. So even taking this up further than that initial assessment, but then how does that lead into generalized wheelchair seating mobility or for own evaluation? So not just the cushion now, but into a CRT system potentially. Also addressing the influence of clinical and risk-related factors of wheelchair cushion selection. So finding a risk assessment that we could utilize um, that would align with the clinical factors um, of the equipment that we would ultimately be recommending highlighting the importance of interdisciplinary care model and pressure injury prevention. So again, getting back to some of those barriers with um, you know, looking at consensus among different disciplines, um, understanding that this had to be an algorithm that could be easily understood and easily interpreted um, across different disciplines um, so that we could establish a standard of care um, that created a consensus and then improved access to knowledge and resources uh, across clinical settings. And this became a real sticking point for me. Um, I kind of dug my heels into this one and I, I figured if we were gonna use uh, this algorithm, then, then there had to be um, something that came out of this that also improved equity and access uh, to resources um, across the division. Um, it was also really important to look at what the scopes of use were going to be. Um, so we decided on that this was going to be used as a component of the admission assessment. Um, so again, really taking a proactive approach um, that that's, that was going to be the, the, the primary aim of this um, to increase that, that point of 
pro, uh, proactiveness for um, risk assessment and also um, equipment uh, procurement. So how quickly could we get an appropriate cushion under someone um, and, and minimize the delay in getting an appropriate cushion under someone, but then also look at a process for further seating and mobility referral and assessment, um, which would be dictated by the individual site. Um, and the reason it was dictated by the individual site is because across um, our different hospital systems, we had different um, setups for how we handled seating and mobility referral and assessment. So for instance, at Kessler in our inpatient wheelchair, um, our, we had an inpatient wheelchair seating team. So we had a dedicated group of staff that handled our wheelchair seating and mobility evaluations and referrals for our, our entire inpatient um, uh, department. Um, but in other hospitals within the inpatient, divi um, inpatient division of select medical, um, some of these evaluations were handled by the primary OT and PT. So we had to um, concede that kind of the triggering event from the initial assessment using the model may need to be individualized um, for individual sites. Um, so within the scope of use, we knew that this was going to be used as a component of the, the emission assessment to really create this kind of proactive um, point of access to equipment um, and identification of risk assessment. But again, that we also wanted to identify a triggering point for further evaluation of mobility assessment uh, for equipment and also seating and positioning equipment. And then once I kind of had this idea of what I wanted the algorithm to do, it was time to look at what metrics to include um, to accomplish those goals. Um, and that's where this evidence-based um, development uh, portion of the process came into play. So um, I conducted a comprehensive literature search um, to identify the clinical basis for the algorithm. This was a broad search performed using uh, PubMed and Medline. It included publications from 2005 onwards. Um, the search terms that I used attempted to capture relevant uh, literature related to both wheelchair cushion selection and pressure injury risk assessment. The aim wasn't to review risk reduction characteristics of any one specific surface. So we weren't looking at what cushions or what types of cushions were the best at pressure injury uh, prevention. Um, again, because the aim of the tool wasn't necessarily um, to identify that specifically. Um, it was an entry point into both risk assessment um, and proactive um, uh, excuse me, um, because specifications are on word, um, but proactive distribution of seating and positioning equipment. And then um, because the purpose of the review was the generation of an algorithm rather than the creation of a systematic review in itself, um, I looked at systematic reviews um, concerning pressure injury high, um, risk assessment um, as primary resources alongside, alongside research that was more specifically related to pressure injury risk and etiology of individuals with spinal cord injury. Um, and the reason that this was because, was because most of the systematic reviews concerning pressure injury risk assessment um, don't involve individuals um, that we primarily see um, concerned with wheelchair um, seating and positioning. Um, these are primarily done in acute rehabilitation hospitals and ICUs and critical care settings. Um, and so the systematic reviews were really helpful in identifying the validity of the risk assessments themselves uh, from a nursing perspective, from a wound care perspective, um, and from just kind of a data mining perspective. Um, whereas the research that was specifically looking at pressure injury risk and etiology for individual spinal cord injury uh, was more effective in identifying some of the risk characteristics of individuals that we would see more in our rehabilitation type settings. So one of those systematic reviews that was really helpful in evaluating risk assessment uh, was this study from Huang et al. in 2021, which uh, looked at the uh, accuracy of the Braden scale in assessing pressure injury risk. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis. It looked at 60 studies um, and almost 50,000 individuals. It did show um, that compared to some other risk assessment scores, the Braden had the higher sensitivity, uh, which just reinforced that it would be a good risk assessment scale for us, which was helpful since this was a scale that we were already using in our hospital system and was already a part of our um, electronic medical record. The evidence did indicate that the Braden had a moderate predictive value. However, um, it had limited diversity of setting and patients. Um, so this is important in general with risk assessment scales. I think as an industry, we have to be more aware 
of the both the diversity of setting and the diversity of set um, of patients um, and patient characteristics that these risk assessment skills are looking at um, and can be a, a future locus of research um, when we start looking at more of these things. Future studies could also explore the optimal cutoff value within the same clinical environment. So because this clinical environment only looked at primarily acute care settings, um, basically the study was saying that potentially within different clinical settings, a more optimal cutoff value for a cumulative score may be more beneficial. Uh, but for the time being, um, for purposes of this, we did um, choose to stay with um, an 18 for the cutoff value. So looking further within the Braden scale, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with it, but it is comprised of those six um, subscales, looking at sensory, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, um, and friction and shear. And those cumulative scores range from um, six being the highest risk to 23 being the lowest risk, uh, with 18 generally being uh, the cutoff. Um, you can also look um, at um, breaking it down between severe, moderate, high, um, and mild risk. Um, this is just a breakdown um, of the subscales themselves. And a lot of what also came out from the more recent uh, data looking at risk assessment validities was that is cumulative scoring really the best data that we can extrapolate from the Braden? So the cumulative Braden score presents with high sensitivity but limitations in specificity. It was also found within the systematic reviews that formal pressure risk assessments associated with intervention protocols were really no more effective in preventing pressure injuries than usual care. Um, and I think this has to do with some of the other research that comes out with that patients that there's kind of a ceiling effect to the Braden um, in that patients that score with a really high maximal risk are already usually individuals that we're assuming maximal interventions for. Um, and kind of colloquially um, or experientially, this happened to me as well. We had um, a wound care nurse once um, that came into our setting from an acute care um, and I was doing moon rounds with her and she asked me about how often we use the Braden and if we use the Braden um, to determine who we were giving out cushions to on our spinal cord injury unit. Um, and, you know, I kind of explained to her that we, most of our patients had high risk. They, they were all scoring. Um, under 18. Um, so it was kind of hard to use the Braden as the sole indicator um, for who we were giving cushions out to and who we weren't giving cushions out to um, because they were all at, at high risk. They were all at maximal risk um, if we were just using that one singular metric. So there's kind of the ceiling effect that occurs with a cumulative score on the Braden, um, especially within um, a lot of rehabilitation settings. And then there's also evidence concerning pressure injury development based on cumulative Braden scores um, that's mixed. So that came from a score, um, a study by um, Alderton um, that we're gonna look um, further at. So what if we break it down instead? So what if we don't look at Braden from a cumulative scale, um, but we'll, what if we look at the subscales? Um, and uh, some studies have looked at this and they've found that um, this can be a more effective way um, at actually determining uh, pressure injury prevention. Um, and there's also one study uh, by GAD that did a retrospective analysis, and they looked at 20 charts of individuals who were initially identified at low risk for pressure injury, uh, but then developed a pressure injury. And in 19% of those cases, they initially presented with low subscale scores um, that would have potentially um, allowed them to have better intervention and better treatment um, that could have potentially mitigated their pressure injury risk um, if they would have utilized subscales rather than cumulative um, uh, scores. Among studies that examine Braden subscale scores, we do see kind of this um, consensus that friction and shear, sensory perception, moisture, and mobility have the highest predictive value. Um, so these were the ones that kind of um, make the most sense as well um, for us from a seating and positioning perspective. If we look further into this, so Alderton um, did some additional analysis of these subscale scores. Um, both by age and by cutoff value. So when we look at sensory perception, the subscale scores showed an increased risk for pressure injury development in younger patients, um, and also um, at the, only at the very limited cutoff, not even at completely limited. 
Moisture was associated with increased risk for pressure injury among older adults um, who were often moist. And I apologize for how awkward <laughs> this slide reads. Um, with activity and mobility, uh, pressure injury uh, risk associated with activities was also more pronounced among older people, particularly among those who were in the walks occasionally category. An altered mobility or um, very limited mobility or completely immobile conferred the most with risks among younger people. The outlier was actually friction and shear. So unlike the cumulative score and other subscales, results for friction and shear subscales should mark increase um, regardless of age. Um, and this kind of was important for two factors. One is that friction and shear isn't generally regarded um, as um, a pressure injury. So, for, so friction and shear um, injuries by the wound care community um, generally aren't, aren't considered uh, traditional pressure injuries. Um, however, um, they do, shear and forces do generally cause a decrease in regional blood flow and therefore are important for pressure injury etiology. Um, and they were the only two scores that kind of um, showed risk across all age groups. The studies also kind of exposed this idea of perceived risk and intervention. And this harkens back a little bit to that idea of the ceiling effect that happens with Braden. So with the exception of friction and shear, individuals with scores in the intermediate risk had the highest likelihood of developing a pressure injury. And one of the reasons that the authors actually thought this happened was that when patients were identified as having the most severe risk, um, maximal preventative measures were applied. Whereas when they had only moderate risk, they may not have received the same level of preventative measures. So generally, it was kind of um, inferred that when they were already had the severe risk, they automatically got these maximal preventative measures. And I think there's actually probably a translation of this to wheelchair seating as well. When we have individuals that present with, you know, lack of full sensation, lack of mobility, we kind of automatically assume that they're going to require seating and positioning interventions that provide the most preventative effects. Whereas if we have individuals that maybe are partially ambulatory or they have partial sensation, we may not always assume that they're going to need maximal preventative measures. So I think there is a correlation between these findings, even though these findings happened um, in the context of a more critical care setting, not related to um, winter seating and mobility equipment. I think there is a, a direct correlation between these findings, um, just from kind of a paradoxical um, standpoint. There is also um, evidence-based precedent um, kind of within um, pertaining to the um, use of Braden subscale scores related to um, support surfaces. So Brenzia et al. in 2010 incorporated combined Braden activity and mobility subscale score into the inclusion criteria for their RCT study on preventing pressure ulcers with wheelchair seat cushions. And McNichol et al. in 2015 developed a mattress support surface algorithm largely driven by moisture and mobility subscales. So once we kind of, once I kind of went through all of the evidentiary support um, for the algorithm and kind of had an idea of where to potentially go with it and how to break down some of the risk assessment um, components of it and how to utilize some of the risk assessments in line with some of the clinical risk factors um, that were indicated um, in a lot of the research that came um, from Clark um, and also um, from some of the data mining done by the VA studies. Um, it, was, it was time to kind of put all that together um, and look at the structure um, and use of the actual um, algorithm itself. Um, so I apologize, this is not the most um, <laughs> well-designed um, algorithm from a, from a graphic design standpoint, um, but try to keep it as simplistic as possible, um, also knowing that potentially it was going to go into um, an EMR um, at some point. Um, but this is the algorithm, um, the draft algorithm that I came up with. Um, so you can see that there's two components um, and that the direct entry point um, is still the cumulative score, um, but from there it breaks down further um, into ad uh, additional clinical factors um, and in the incidence of a score over 19 um, in an, into additional risk assessment factors. So there's generally two components to the algorithm. So the first component um, is the assessment component. So the user enters the algorithm at a point of initial evaluation followed by pressure injury risk assessment. 
Um, and this is based on the overall risk for pressure injury development as defined by that braiding cutoff of 18. If the initial score is greater than 18, as it is um, in this portion of the algorithm, then the user follows a pathway that requires additional information on a subscale score and the presence of postural asymmetries. And the incorporation of the postural and braiding subscales, um, as we've discussed in the findings literature review, is really designed to capture a broader subset of the potential of at-risk population and help identify those risk factors that most contribute to the individual specific increased risk. And this increased specificity is also designed to assist with the clinical decision making during the final equipment selection process, um, which occurs kind of after this broader uh, categorization of the cushion um, being determined by the algorithm. Um, if it's less than 18, then the user follows a pathway that guides clinical decision making, whether there's the need for positioning features in addition to skin protection. Um, and this is indicated by the presence of significant postural asymmetry, pressure injury history, or pressure relief independence. And again, it's kind of this combination of both risk assessment as well as evaluation findings, as well as components of the medical history that can kind of all work together. Um, kind of going back to this slide for a second with the subscales, these subscale cutoff scores did come directly from um, those evidence-based findings um, from the systematic review. So that's how we kind of determined, or I kind of determined um, where that cutoff was gonna be for, for those subscale scores. Um, so we kind of, try, kind of tried to mash up as much as we could from both the studies that involved direct correlations with risk factors from um, spinal cord injury studies, um, as well as from the nursing and wound care studies. Some of the clinical considerations. Um, so looking at the risk assessment scale validity, the risk scale integrator reliability, so those relating directly back to some of the research studies looking at the Braden and the Braden subscales, and then more importantly, the attribution of the subscale scores to those clinical risk indicators, and of course, the usability across the interdisciplinary team. So this had to make sense, again, both to individuals familiar with seating and positioning, as well as individuals not familiar with seating and positioning, um, and had to have, you know, if someone, if a physician was looking at this, um, or even potentially, if um, someone who is using this for um, in the future, potential insurance justification as part of a letter of medical necessity. It had to um, have usability um, across multiple uh, modes of access and modes of use. The second component um, is the equipment categorization. So once we move on to equipment categorization, we can see that the algorithm utilizes language consistent with Medicare coding and LCD coverage criteria. And this was to really help standardize terminology and allow for that potential utilization as part of letters of medical justification. So again, even though this algorithm was designed as a more proactive entry point into um, a, a equipment um, and risk assessment, it has the potential to also be utilized um, as part of a seating and mobility evaluation, a formal seating and mobility evaluation. Um, because it does combine aspects of clinical risk indicators um, as well as generalized risk assessment for pressure injury prevention. Um, so that's, I think, one of the future use cases um, of the algorithm is looking at it um, kind of in its reverse use case, uh, which is can it be used from, from a justification standpoint as well. Uh, this also helps um, with alignment with the supplement, supplemental materials put in place by the clinical team to assist with alignment of clinical risk factors uh, with equipment features as well. And if we look on the other side of the algorithm, uh, we can see the same thing. Um, you can see though that um, there's not an option for uh, the general use cushions uh, or positioning cushions, um, generally because we're entering uh, the algorithm with a lower cumulative score. Um, and we're also, um, so then we're assuming that there's a higher risk and a kind of a higher risk start value, if you will. Um, so generally these, these individuals are gonna fall um, into higher um, prevention interventions. I'm just taking a look at that chat real quick. <laughs> 
Um, so Kara, I think on the next uh, slide, um, uh, in the next couple slides, we might be able to talk about that a little bit. Um, but if I don't answer your question uh, within the presentation, uh, we can touch base on it at the uh, end. Um, clinical considerations for uh, equipment categorization. So alignment of the algorithm with current wheelchair cush uh, cushion justification criteria, utilization for the WCSA um, for evidentiary support, medical necessity, and development of the algorithm as an adjunct to skilled intervention. Um, so those were our primary kind of clinical considerations for the equipment categorization uh, section of the algorithm. So created alongside the algorithm was an equipment reference guide. So as a supplement, um, this was proposed and intended to be kept updated and relevant to each individual's hospital wheelchair cushion inventory. Um, this reference guide, um, uh, excuse me, uh, this reference guide would include a breakdown of kind of the available wheelchair cushions um, to trial and use kind of at each different setting. Um, so this could be adapted um, to different settings that are utilizing the algorithm based on which equipment um, that they have access to. They would be identified using the same categories as the algorithm, but additionally outline clinical features relevant to the braid and subscales, including material construction, shape, uh, shear reduction properties, uh, pressure redistribution properties, microclimate properties, um, and would also contain kind of general clinical comments made by the wheelchair team. Um, the development of the guide um, also assisted in bringing kind of to the forefront um, that discussion about allocation of resources and equipment across hospitals within our specific inpatient division and not just those seeing higher percentages of spinal cord injury and brain injury populations. Um, so essentially um, this was how I <laughs> kind of snuck in um, that increased access and equity of, of resources. So kind of by developing this equipment reference guide and, and developing it alongside the algorithm, it was my way of kind of leveraging uh, the access that we had um, as a larger system within our inpatient division to say, well, if we have access to these resources and this is the equipment that we're recommending alongside the algorithm, um, then we should really make these same resources and the same equipment um, available to all of the hospitals within the division. Um, so this was one way we, we kind of leveraged uh, the algorithm to um, improve access uh, to equipment uh, across um, the entire division. Um, so this is an example of the equipment reference guide. Um, it is slightly redacted. Um, <laughs> so because I work for an equipment manufacturer now, um, I did redact uh, the cushions that we had recommended. Um, and I also redacted my personal uh, comments on each cushion. Um, although I'm sure it could be a fun game that all of you are playing at home to try to decide which cushions uh, go with which um, uh, indicators, um, I will say that all the information uh, labeled uh, within this chart um, is available on each manufacturer's website. Um, it's not proprietary information. Uh, the comments were, which is why I removed them. Uh, but this is kind of an example of what that equipment reference guide uh, looked like. Um, so, um, Carrie, you're asking about um, examples of cushions falling into each category. Um, this, this is kind of what um, that would look like. Um, so, essentially, um, these were also color coded uh, to match uh, the algorithm. Um, so, you can see the different boxes are color coded, um, and the reference guide uh, was color coded as well. Um, so we broke them down into their different categories and then broke them down into their different features and kind of created a reference guide that, be, that be, could be used to supplement um, the algorithm. As far as the plan for implementation, so the implementation plan included educational models targeting wound care um, injury prevention modules for therapy staff and nursing um, time with yearly clinical competency training. This was to be followed by the development of electronic medical, medical record documentation standards and the design of individuals at each site to serve um, as leads for their respective therapy teams. Um, at those sites, the dedicated ATP and wheelchair team um, would um, head the education and planning. Um, while sites without a dedicated wheelchair leader ATP would complete um, a train the trainer program and offer clinical support from other sites as, as needed. We also, um, for those sites without um, a dedicated wheelchair um, 
uh, seating and positioning team or ATP um, toyed around with the idea of offering um, essentially telehealth communication or, or virtual consultation um, for those sites with other um, hospitals within the system um, that did have access to those resources. So what comes after? Um, so there were some limitations uh, in the rollout. Um, so due to the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, as well as staffing changes, the implementation of the algorithm uh, in the trial um, during patient care was, was put on hold. Um, so Kessler is in the New York, New Jersey area. We got hit pretty hard with um, the pandemic early on um, that changed some of our, our patient care um, modeling. It also changed um, some of our staffing needs. Um, so we were unfortunately unable um, to proceed with kind of rolling this out while I was still um, at Kessler. Um, the task force did successfully complete and implement the education modules um, in time with yearly competency training. Um, I also do know that they're um, continuing to roll out uh, pressure injury uh, prevention protocols um, and education. Um, but for now, um, the use of the algorithm uh, is on hold. Some potential research questions. Um, so, you know, a lot more questions came out of this. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, as I started developing this, um, looking at some of the other things that we could consider, some of the other questions we could ask, some of the other things that potential, potentially this could lead to, um, I think there's some inter interesting questions that come out of it. So assessing whether a guided wheelchair cushion selection tool could reduce the risk of incidence of hospital fire pressure injuries. Um, and some of the variables that we might consider, um, looking at things like setting, presence of dedicated seating and mobility clinicians, um, staff conducting the initial assessment and referral, as well as concurrence with other assessment tools. And then looking at some of those other tools we could consider, you know, thinking on our end interventions like interface pressure mapping, uh, mat evaluations, formalized assessment um, to further, further rule in or out optimal support surfaces, but also from a broader look about what's happening within the world of wound care assessment and prevention, perhaps looking at concurrent assessment uh, methods or risk assessment with things like sub-epidermal uh, moisture scanners or ultrasound scanners to trigger the need for seating and positioning referral or evaluation, uh, as well as to provide additional clinical insight or clinical indications for equipment selection factors. And then I think also the tool could be useful in identifying whether or not it increases clinical confidence regarding equipment selection, um, and also whether or not it increases rate of referrals for complex rehab technology. So I think a lot of times, you know, for um, especially for rehabilitation settings, um, where maybe I think, you know, it's one of the things I've noted now in my role as a, as a clinical educator is looking at, you know, going into a setting where I think there's there should be more referrals for complex rehab technology, right? Looking at the case mix index, looking at the individuals um, and the patient populations that are there, um, you know, why aren't we seeing as many complex rehab technology referrals? And I think maybe one of the triggering factors uh, for clinicians really could be um, seating and positioning. So if we develop a tool that is a triggering um, indicator for clinicians, um, you know, could that increase the rate of referrals for complex rehab um, technology um, and really get them thinking about, you know, who really is appropriate for, for wheeled mobility um, and, and maybe using seating and positioning um, as, a, as a clinical indication for the application of, of wheeled mobility. Um, and then finally, some, some clinical discussion points. Um, so some positive indications for use, um, some things that, you know, I personally took away from this um, that I liked about um, in developing the algorithm were its adaptability. Um, so obviously this was developed for a inpatient hospital division um, in the United States, um, but I think it could be easily adapted um, using different language, um, using different, um, you know, equipment modifiers um, at the end for um, you know, different categorization of equipment. Um, just because that's the language that we chose to use because it made the most sense for the, uh, the potential end use case, um, doesn't mean that it couldn't be adapted to other models of care or other um, di different um, settings. Um, it's translation, um, again, across different service and provision uh, processes, as well as its capability to translate uh, knowledge across differ different interdisciplinary um, uses um, is you know, very promising, I think. Um, also its potential translation 
um, from a predictive indicator um, to one as a potential justification tool uh, for medical justification. Um, and as well as its um, use of evidence-based support for specifically for um, cushion selection um, and application um, as a preventative measure. And then obviously there's also lots of questions that remain. Um, so because this wasn't able to be utilized as a, as a component of patient care, you know, what's its content um, validation? Uh, what are we looking at for its actual feasibility? And then what is the optimal trigger for a seating and mobility assessment and referral? So, you know, is it within the risk assessment itself? Um, you know, is there a certain subscale score or is there a certain combination of subscale score plus clinical indicator um, that is a good potential trigger for individuals completing the assessment tool that could then trigger further seating and mobility assessment and referral? Um, what's its effectiveness compared to clinical judgment alone? Um, was this all just a waste of time? <laughs> um, you know, you know, is there is there any you know good use for this? Um, or if we were to evaluate this from a research standpoint, would we find as has been found with some of the other risk assessment scales, where it's really it's really not that big of a, a difference between clinical judgment alone? Um, is complexity a barrier? Is this too complex of an assessment um, to be utilized and utilized effectively? Um, are clinicians just gonna say, no, it's too much trouble? Um, how well is it gonna assimilate into an electronic medical record system? Um, and is this standardization at the cost of specialized assessment? So this is a, something that's kept me up at night. You know, are, are people gonna look at this and are they gonna say, well, why would I do a specialized assessment if I can just use the tool that's gonna tell me the answer? Um, and I think that's the worst case scenario. You know, in no means do I think that this is the tool that should replace specialized assessment. Um, but I, I do think there's a use case where we can um, look at standardization in conjunction with specialization um, and in customization of care. Um, and, and standardization doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, I think it can lead to some good things, but I also think uh, we do run the risk of saying, well, if we standardize care, um, does that mean that we don't have to specialize it? Um, so I, I think that's certainly a, a risk worth considering and a risk worth talking about when we start looking at these things, especially in looking at the complexity um, of the problem at hand. Um, so that's what I have. Um, I know there were a couple questions. Um, I, I can make the slides available. Um, I initially uh, just made the algorithm available and the reference available. Um, but if you would like um, a copy of the slides, um, I can either you can either email me um, or I can see if I can make them available um, in the handout section um, as well. Um, I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions. I was trying to keep up with the chat. Um, Kara, if I didn't answer your question, um, I'd be happy to talk about it a little bit further. All right, so we'll give everyone a few seconds to enter some questions in the chat if you have a few. It looks like a few are coming in now, Sarah. Sure. So the, there was a couple requests to have your email. Oh, it, the email is on the screen there. I see that, <laughs> so that is one. Um, and then another question for you was, do you think perhaps this is more useful for IPR units that are less frequently using CRT in our facility stroke unit versus CS, or excuse me, versus SCI um, that does CRT regularly? giving less experienced clinicians a decision-making tool. Definitely, and I, th and I think that was, that's primarily what it was initially designed for. Um, I think that's why, you know, rating kind of the additional questions about the research about increasing clinical confidence for those clinicians. Um, it's also something that now in my new role in clinical education, um, seeing more and more of. Um, and that's why initially I was kind of skeptical about developing a tool like this, but the more I talked with some of my colleagues at the other inpatient rehab hospitals within the select medical division that didn't have the same access to resources and the same um, access to um, knowledge resources that I had, you know, um, 
I am lucky enough to work with Mary Shea. Um, you know, she, um, I learned a lot from her and I had a, a great resource um, between her and between my colleagues at Kessler with Cindy Granger um, and Mary Kabarley. And um, I learned from Sean McCarthy. So, you know, I had all this access to resources and I had I had a, a built-in um, education tool right there that I could just go and ask questions to um, when I had questions about products and I had ready access to equipment manufacturers that I could ask questions to. Um, but especially in a lot of more rural areas of the country, country um, where it might not be, they might not have, have as much access to other clinician resources or other manufacturer resources. I think utilization of a tool like this, where they just also don't see the volume of patients where this may be as applicable, um, this could be used as a tool to, to improve access and, and improve clinical confidence. Um, and that's why it's also important to maybe um, a way to to develop maybe a network to support these clinicians um, as they're as they're going through this clinical de uh, decision making process, um, but yeah, I, I do think that's the best the best use case scenario um, uh, for this tool. All right, so if we don't have any other questions, I will provide the CEU code. And if you have any other questions you want to put in the chat, feel free to do so. So I'll right now just enter the CEU code in the chat, but I'll also announce it. It is V7JD21. Again, that's V7JD21. And if anybody has any questions too, um, I can head over to the Permobile booth for a while um, and I can hang out there. Um, so feel free to um, come and ask questions there or, or send me an email, but um, I can head over there. Um, and I know some of my colleagues from, from Kessler are on this. So hi, I miss working with you guys. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out. Great job, Sarah. Thank you.